like to introduce our next speaker, Bill Lu. Uh, Bill is the Chief Digital Officer at GE and the CEO of GE Digital. Bill joined the GE in 2011 to lead GE's industrial internet strategy, which as many of you could imagine, it's not an easy task to accomplish given the, the, the hardware-centric nature of the company. In his role, uh, Bill focused on building GE software and analytics capability, and also embedding software solutions across all GE's business lines. So he also led the effort to develop the first cloud-based platform for the industrial internet, uh, Predix. So with that, let's welcome Bill. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Um, so I, you know, I joined GE seven years ago from Cisco. And uh, over that time, uh, we've seen a lot of digital disruption in the industrial world. I want to talk about what uh, sort of what we see as the four major market trends that we've learned over this period of time, and the four major, uh, let's say, uh, things we've learned about an industrial firm, or I would even say any large firm trying to take digital and not be disrupted, but be a disruptor. So really the outside perspective and the inside perspective of this. So when we look at it, I think the first thing is there was a lot of discussion when I joined GE seven years ago about was digital actually going to disrupt industrial businesses? Or was this just a consumer related uh, trend and that was where it was going to be? and that these physical uh, devices, power plants and locomotives, et cetera, there was really no disruption that was, uh, was really going to occur. And, and I think that this has kind of come to rest. And you know, what I believe is that this is just a series of dominoes where as the te digital technology gets better and cost effective, it's going to impact every industry. And one of the things that we could say we've learned from the consumer side if, of this is that what, uh, what the disruption is usually centered around in our mind is pretty simple, is that even in the consumer world, companies have taken an asset, not necessarily a physical asset, but an asset, and they are able to make it more efficient. And if you look at, uh, if you think about Google, Google took advertising and just made it more efficient through search, through digital technology as a delivery mechanism, and as a result, they completely disrupted who makes money on advertising today? And if you look at Apple, Apple disrupted the application market. It wasn't, I don't think, their entire intent. But by coming out with a smartphone, they have changed how applications are distributed. And by the way, who makes money and how they make money. And then if you look at Uber, they've disrupted taxi services and, uh, or Lyft, who you'll all use tonight, I'm sure, with your free giveaway, um, but they've disrupted uh, the, that environment and the fact that you own a physical asset becomes less important. And if you look at that, we start to see disruption now and I would claim the, the, the next disruption is going to occur in the automotive industry, not so much through electrification of cars, but through what's happening in autonomous driving, which is the digital uh, trend. And it's going to change who makes money, how we buy cars, and so on. And the only thing that's changed is the consumer companies never saw it company. So if you look, you are really hard to point out a consumer business that actually pushed back on digital and won and wasn't disrupted. So the industrial companies like us were all worried, and I came in seven years ago before it was thought it would be disrupted to say, okay, what if it was disrupted? And now we see it's happening, and I'll talk about that. But the one thing we can all learn, I think, in this, or what we believe, is it's very simple. You take an asset, you become very good at efficiently delivering that asset or the capability of it through software, and you create a really compelling uh, digital experience. And the really scary thing is you don't need to own the asset. In fact, other people usually own the asset you're making money on. So that, for a company that's an industrial firm, whether you're an automotive or a GE, can become a very scary thing because the profit pools change when this occurs. Who makes money and how they make money 
uh, are fundamentally disrupted. And we think the energy market be disrupted, the transportation market, et cetera. So just making the product is no longer the source of value, okay? So for us, we realize you have to become not an industrial, but a digital industrial. And I think you can see that in the automotive now, where a company like GM has, uh, has really made an effort to become a leader in this. And one could say they are in the battle just as much as, as anybody else is today. And it isn't clear who's going to win that. So I think we're in a different time because everybody gets it. Unfortunately, places like Harvard Business School talk about it, that maybe big companies can win this and push back going forward. And I'd say that's, that's the first thing. The second thing is that when you look at, from a GE perspective, how we begin to think about this, um, it isn't that it's a technology-driven approach in the industrial world. It's not that it's going to be an approach that is driven, let's say, by um, how cool you can be or do you have the latest technology. But one thing we can learn is that the industrial space is clearly going to be about can you, in fact, drive efficiency to either save money or make money through that process. And, uh, and so, in the end, what what a manufacturing company is not going to care about is am I socially cool or great technology? They're going to care about four things. Increased throughput, decreased downtime, increased productivity, increased machine utilization. All of the most dull and boring things you could think about, but actually this is going to be the center point of the value. And I always say this, the, you know, the, four, uh, the three uh, sexiest uh, words to an industrialist is zero unscheduled downtime. So, this is what they think about. So when you, and, and if you think about it, think about, uh, you know, you're going to get on a flight, 41% on average of all flights are delayed or canceled because of mechanical error. So if we can get rid of mechanical error, we can foundationally change the economics of the aviation industry, for example, there. Uh, now, you can't change the weather, you can't change uh, the FAA, but you can, in fact, change uh, how you manage, maintain these kind of machines. And we're moving to a world of zero unscheduled downtime inside of these, and they have huge economic uh, implications. They also have huge implications, I think, to the prior discussion on who does work, and we'll talk about that in a second. But the, uh, when we started this seven years ago, you know, we did our own study and found that we thought there was about a trillion and a half dollars of value that was available to this world. And what's interesting is that this has actually become um, a mantra and, and a discussion point in many, many forums. And the World Economic Forum, I think, was probably where this came together last year, where they put, published a report that said, look, there's going to be $6.8 trillion of money that is going to be moved through who is going to get this value. So it's either going to be the existing industrials will continue to get the value, or new companies or new folks who provide the value are going to come in and they're going to access this. So this is a huge prize, and it actually is larger than the consumer change that's occurred in, say, the last uh, 20 years, some 19, say, the mid, uh, late 90s to today. So we're going to see a huge change. And within this, there's a lot of categories. So just the idea of zero on scheduled downtime in predicting uh, something will fail, what's called asset performance management, because we love dull and boring uh, concepts inside of industrial, uh, is worth $700 billion uh, on its own uh, per year. So these are the kinds of changes we see in the marketplace. Now, when you, uh, when you look at, um, uh, you know, from a GE perspective, I give you this uh, thought about what does it take to make a change for an industrial in order to, to do this. So you see a big market. You know the change is coming. You know the technology is going to drive this. You know the value and the business models are going to change. And now you say, okay, great, I'm, gonna, I'm going to do this. The real problem is that big companies are totally unprepared with no capacity or capability to actually do this. Now, I'm overstating that a bit, but to put it in perspective, if you start, just the technology architecture here is changing. So when you look at the technology, it's not your tried and true ERP. The Bitcoin discussion is a great example of that technology is going to change a certain set of the way we work going forward, and not everybody understands that technology. So in, in this, 
you have a fundamental shift of the architecture into what would be called edge to cloud architecture. And the fact is most companies, have, most large companies, don't have the capacity to deal with this. So they're not prepared with, the, with any capability because their architecture, let's say, exists as ERP, some networking, uh, the idea of using the internet in a certain way. And that architecture will not get you to where you need to go. So unless you've got the talent to rethink the architecture, you can't play. The second big change that's coming is, uh, and this goes to a lot of what, we, what was discussed tonight, is that the traditional industrial world is one where people told machines what to do. When you drive a car, you tell the machine what to do, it does what it's told, everybody's happy. The future world, and it won't, and is moving towards where uh, machines tell people what to do. And essentially, driverless cars are, peop are machines telling, uh, they don't actually don't tell you what to do, they'll just take you where you're going to go, but they don't even ask your opinion or tell you anything, they just do it. And the fact is that when you look at any industrial process, we're going to see it move to fully autonomous, and driverless cars are only one example, and they're not even the most interesting. We are going to see most systems become autonomous, and people will still be involved, but they will be guided by the machines to do their jobs in a different way. And this has an immense implication, which I'll talk about in a bit, that says that the, the real problem is you must change how you operate your business, and most companies are unprepared for this shift. So it does mean the new entrants who have the technology knowledge and are willing to break models and say, I'm going to have machines tell people what to do, are more likely to win than people say, hey, no, we've done it that way for 100 years. We're not going to change. And this is at the foundation of why a big company will find it very hard to do this. And I'll give you a quick example. Um, about seven years ago, we just tried some analytics on a very simple problem in hospitals, which is bed management. And it was a, a, a hospital that had, uh, that had an oversupply of patients. It's the kind of thing where you don't want patients waiting 24 hours for a bed. And I didn't understand, but bed management can become very complicated. Certain beds are meant for certain kind of patients. And people in the healthcare industry understand this. And you assign a lot of staff to figure this out. But the information is so vast, the big data problem we talk about, that analytics is perfect for this to improve bed utilization in a hospital and to get people into beds faster in the right bed. And it's not always intuitive based on the analytics. Now, we built a set of algorithms to test out, put it in place. And in the beginning, we found there was zero change. So the, everybody said, well, why didn't this improve? So we went and looked. And of course, you had people, in this case, who did bed management. When they got the answer, if they liked the answer and it was what they thought, they did it. Hey, I'm so smart. If they didn't like the answer, they wouldn't do it. And they say, the machine's dumb. So you still have people telling machines what to do, essentially. And as a result, you saw no change. So now you go in and say, OK, let's tell them why the change is taking place. And now they'll make better decisions. And they did. And in fact, it got better, but it wasn't perfect. And so then we said, why isn't it as efficient as we thought? So you go back into this, and then you begin to realize that there's another piece of this, which is the human involvement. And it turns out that the nurses are human. So they would look and whether knowingly or unknowingly, if they liked the doctor, they, put the, they grouped their rooms together. And if they didn't like the doctor, they put them as far apart as they could in the hospital for rounds. And then suddenly, the human element comes into this. And it turns out only parts of that can be changed. So as we look at this, just having great algorithms without figuring out this cultural element will not change anything. And that's why it's hard for an existing organization to make the change is because people are involved. A couple of final thoughts, and then we're going to get into the questions is this, that the whole world, that big companies have to not try to compete with the existing, uh, let's say, technology companies that are out there, that compute algorithms, AI, uh, is going to be a commodity. So the fact is you go work with a Microsoft or an Amazon or whoever you choose, Google, you pick for us, we don't view that as the value. But the real value is in your domain data and your domain knowledge. And guess what? Most domain data in big companies is thrown away. And the real thing is you've got to figure out how you get the data and then how you utilize it. And this 
is a real problem because business people don't think this way. But if you look at why taxi companies didn't create Ubers, they didn't understand the technology. So how's the supply chain guy going to understand the technology unless you teach them through this process and get them to think about it? But if they don't, you're going to be like a taxi company because you just won't understand it enough. You won't figure out your unique data, your domain expertise, and you bring that to the table to differentiate yourself. Last couple of uh, slides is, is that if you start to think about how this can change things, I just give one example. We acquired an AI company to do this, and when you, when you look at the kinds of things we're going to see different, is this is just the idea of how do we do pipeline management to detect leaks. In this case, the amount of data that is coming off a pipeline is incredible. And the idea that you can begin to rethink how you manage pipelines is going to be foundationally changed through this uh, kind, of, uh, kind of process. Uh, for us, I think it, the fact is that we have seen this occur. We've got seven years of experience. I won't go through this, but what we've seen is when industries realize how to do this and when they can see real outcomes, they move pretty fast in adopting this technology. So the last thing I, I would say is that when I look at the one thing I would do different from seven years ago that I didn't understand is the real thing wasn't the technology. The technology is important. The real thing is three, three things you focus on, leadership, uh, talent, and culture. And I, I just leave you this thought. The hardest thing is, to, is those th three things in a company. Leadership is, let me, is just saying, can my, not that you bring people from the outside with the technology, but can a supply chain person figure out how to apply this to change the game? Because if you can't get that, you can't really change your company. The second, so you need digital natives, but you've got to have digital migrants in your organization. Talent, you've got to be willing to hire people and open up new kinds of skills and talent to complement it, but you've got to bring existing people along or they're going to fall behind. The last thing is culture. Culture means your processes are often set up a way to, to deal with the way you used to do things. And if you don't change the, the culture and embrace this, you can't actually figure out how to uh, use the technology for advantage. So those are some of the things I've learned through this process. So thank you. And let me open it up for any questions or thoughts or, or uh, you know, challenges you guys may have. Other than the uh, talent issues that you mentioned, yeah. uh, what are the, what's the big mistakes that companies make when they try to transform themselves in a digital world? Well, I, I think there's two things that I see. And let me, one thing, I, I would put this in the context of big companies uh, often try to compete on speed, just like small companies. So they go visit Silicon Valley and they say, I'm going to be like them, I'm going to be fast. And then they have, there's, no, there's sort of a dead silence as to what the heck they do. Because you can't be fast no matter, no matter what. You're going to have to compete on scale. And so when you start to think about it, I think what a lot of companies, the mistake I see is they start to say, hey, we're going to incubate this separate. Which means, OK, I'm going to compete on scale, but I still have a bureaucracy on it, whether I meant to. And everybody in the old company kind of hates the new thing because they get treated differently, they get money. And you know, I think the fact is that that is, is not, and, and the new thing never embraces the scale. So one thing is, you just got to lean into it. It's your company that's got to change, the culture and everything else. And your one thing you have is scale. So for us, once we really figure out how to do this in scale, meaning be able to go after the existing install-based customers, allow the existing businesses to play in this and feel like they know how to grow their own and win in this, that's when things took off for us. And the hard thing is really believing I can figure out how to deal with the scale, because the old part of the company doesn't understand what to do with it. They're very uncomfortable with it. Usually it's like, I don't, you know, they just so far and they don't embrace it. So you can't get the scale. At the same time, you try to set up something and say, I'll compete on speed. And no one has ever uh, really been able to make that work. So I think organizationally, you've got to lean into what you've got, bringing the existing along. And it is not easy. And I would say it took us about three years to work through how we blend the old with the new and get it embedded in the businesses and still have a horizontal. And you also have to deal with the ups and, I mean, I've been ups and downs with this company, and you have to deal with the, 
and be respectful for the existing company and how they make money while you try to do it. That is the hardest thing I've seen, and uh, I don't think most companies know how to do that, but I think over time, those, will be, those that have succeed will have, will have just leaned into making it work with the existing part of the organization. Great company. Question. Keep going. We have some. Um, you talked about the, uh, the commoditization of the algorithms on, on the compute. Yeah. Um, do GE have any interest, or, or is it something you're considering um, to, to tackle the data problem, things like transfer learning or synthetic data? Is that, is that too far away for, for, for GE? Not, not to say that GE is yeah. um, not for, forward looking, but is, no, it, no. is it something that you're looking at now, I guess? Yeah, so here's what I meant by that, is I'm not gonna create a Cortana and try to compete with Microsoft or Google and, and so on. There is plenty of, let's say, of tools out there. And I think there was a rush, if you go back with a, a lot of the companies in the last three to four years, there was a rush that everybody thought they had to build the whole stack. And I think the idea is, how do you build on the stacks that are coming with where there's investment? So when you look at where we start to think about it, we talk about synthetic data, that's one where we can add value because it's our synthetic data. It's our unique domain capability. And um, so we bought this company, Wise.io, and instead of saying, hey, go build you know, these general purpose capabilities, what we're saying, and what they've embraced actually was, okay, take that pipeline example. We want you working at this higher level of applying this technology to coming up with real solutions. We want to predict where a leak will occur before it occurs based on all the data. And believe it or not, we think we can. And, um, and then you have to decide, the hard part's not predicting the leak. The hard part then is using that same tool set to say run a million simulations and say what's the best thing to do about it. Do I fix it now? Do I fix it tomorrow? Or can I wait a year now? Do I bring the pressure down? What is the way to optimize keeping this thing, this whole ecosystem working? And I think that's what I meant by where our efforts are. I, wouldn't, I don't want to disparage to say that's easy, because what those guys are doing is this idea of a digital twin, a real live digital twin of a pipeline that is running in real time with all the data coming in, both real data, real time data, historical data, synthetic data, and all kinds of other uh, kinds of algorithms to then run a, a crystal ball and say, here are your three best options and why and here's what you ought to do about it, and do it on a consistent basis. And I think, so I, I think that's where our value ends up coming. And I think in the beginning, we started thinking we were lower down in the stack. The question is, moving to the right place in the stack to win the battle is the most important thing. Great question. Time for one more. Uh, GE stock has had a lot of ups and downs, or downs and sideways. It really, it really has, hasn't it? Yeah. <laughs> I hadn't noticed. As a shareholder. Um, and Jeff Ilmolt was yeah. closely associated with the yeah. digital industrial strategy, and now John Flannery yeah. is revisiting that. Can you speak to, as you've been whipsawed by that, what's been yeah. the impact on you? Well, here's the funny thing. I, I really have never been whipsawed by it. The transition from... Jeff to John has been, uh, and John is fully behind digital. He, and, and let me be clear, it's not like it's today you go, it's a choice, right? Because there are some capital allocation decisions you can make about which part of the portfolio to be in, et cetera. And that's, at that level, I mean, John has to deal with a much broader set of topics around capital allocation portfolio. When you look at digital, and, and he's been crystal clear about this, this is not something you can say, I don't think I have to be digital to win in the future. Because you do have to be digital in order to have the products and services that are going to win with the customer. So I think that's number one, and I, felt, I feel really good about that. I think the, as the thing that's a challenge as, as we go forward is to really focus and um, uh, where do you focus? Because you could do a lot in digital industrial. So should we be in automotive, should we not, et cetera? And where I would say uh, that we've continued to refine is based on two years of operating this business, um, you know, we're refining where we're making those decisions. 
and we're stretching out where we might push certain things a few years out before we address them. So I'll give you what has been probably, you know, it's an aha moment, and maybe it's like an, oh, duh, you should have known that. Our sale to our install base is uh, twice as fast and twice as big. So it's four times more valuable for me to sell to the install base. We sold $1.4 billion of predicts orders last year, 90% in the install base. And, um, and if you look at that, uh, that basis, that's 7.7% of our install base. And by the way, those are subscriptions. So what I'm excited about is that, uh, you know, even just with our install base, what we're doing is, put, is we're doubling down on the install base. We are, we're not ignoring, let's say, the rest of the world, but it's a question of how you do capital allocation. And the real difference, I would say, is, is that John has, uh, you know, based on how we've used the overall portfolio, is looking at the capital allocation with us and asking us to be thoughtful about things that he thinks are important. Give me the best return, you know, for the next several years. Build this out. Show me what it is. We showed him it, showed him the install base. He's like, that's where I want you to focus. So I actually feel I'm in great shape. I love where we are. I love our growth. But I have to wait and see how the portfolio comes out and I'm going to align to that. But he also is bringing, I'd say, a focus to how do we get this thing moving uh, even faster than it has been. So that's how I feel. And again, I've, I've never felt whipsawed, and he's been very clear about it. And the last thing is the first place he visited when he became CEO was uh, out in San Ramon, the digital headquarters. So I, I feel you know, all the love in the world that I could possibly feel. <laughs> all right, thank you very much.